I would like to ask you onliners this question. If you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? Have you ever thought about that? If God was to hold your foot and open up the pits of hell and ask you, give me one good reason why I shouldn't drop you into hell, what would be your automatic answer? Do you have absolutely no fear and you have 100% assurance that you go to heaven after you die? Some people don't have that assurance. Some people say you can never know. There are other people who says I live my life for Jesus and as a Christian all my life. So because of that, I do know that I can go to heaven after I die. Well, uh, in this teaching, what I want to point out is to please be serious about your salvation. First of all, we're going to go to Romans 3 and also turn to 2 Corinthians 13, please. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. It is important to understand that, especially if you've been watching our channel for a while, that you don't continually watch without getting saved. Amen. And it is so important. So many people don't know the plan of salvation. So many people think they're saved when they're actually not saved. My friend, you want to know 100% that you're going to go to heaven after you die. It's something you need to make sure, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, people, they do get offended when you ask them if they're saved, and some people get upset. Of course I'm saved. Or when you ask them if they're saved and they, didn't give, they do not give the right answer, and you want to make sure of their salvation, they get mad at you. And my friend, you shouldn't get mad. If someone cares about your soul burning in this awful place of torment with Satan, the Leviathan, he is waiting underneath this lake of fire to gobble and eat you up to make sure that you burn in hell forever with him. That's right. So you don't want to end up in this place of torment. It is such an awful place. And you want to make 100% sure. The Bible says that if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, that it is a good thing to make sure if you're saved. You shouldn't get mad. You shouldn't get offended. I mean, the Bible says that the book of Psalms, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. If you really love the word of God, you won't get offended. And what did the word of God say? It says that you should make sure of your salvation at verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? It's a question that's asking you to examine yourself if you are truly saved. Are you 100% sure? If someone were to ask me that question, if I'm 100% sure if I would go to heaven after I die, I wouldn't get offended. I would thank the person for caring about my soul. I would smile that the person is being a soul winner Amen. and trying to make sure that I know my salvation, that I make doubly sure about what would happen. Romans 3.23, notice that the passage reads, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, let's make sure if you're truly saved or not. So let's go back to the basics. Let's go back all the way to the beginning. First of all, you've got to understand that you can't go to heaven after you die. You might say, why is that? It's because of a huge gap called sin. Now, you'll notice that from this drawing over here, in this ocean, is representing sin itself. And it's on the way to the lake of fire at the bottom. Uh, people get upset. Why do you call me a sinner? Well, the Bible says that to qualify as a sinner, it says, for all have sinned. Why? Come short of the glory of God. The idea is, is because you are not as perfect as God. Amen. Because you are not as perfect as God, that's the reason why you're a sinner. I mean, look at that verse. Don't look at me like a tree full of owls. I mean, look at that verse. It says that, why are you a sinner? Because you fall short of God's glory up there. So let me ask you a simple question. Uh, are you as perfect as God? I mean, let's be honest. Thought, life, action, word, and deed. No one is. You might say, well, I've been a Christian all my life. I love Jesus. I do the best that I can. It doesn't matter. You're still a sinner. Amen. You are still a sinner because the Bible says that 
you have to be as perfect as God in order to qualify as a saved person. But let's be honest, no one is perfect. That's right. No one is perfect. No one is righteous. Mm -hmm. So because no one is perfect, no one is righteous, you do not qualify as a saved Christian. You might say, well, why do you qualify as a saved Christian? Because I'm not uh, in my sin anymore in this ocean. I've taken up salvation through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you get that? Well, I'm trying to show you now. The idea is you first recognize that you're lost. You're a sinner. That's the first step. You might say, really? Yeah, you have to realize that. Because how can you be saved if you don't realize what you're being saved from? Yes, sir. You know what you're being saved from? You're being saved from this, from hellfire, because of your sin. Amen. That's right. You must first recognize that. If you recognize that, it's a no-brainer. We can all admit that we've sinned before. So because of that, that's why the Bible says you sinned. That's right. Well, the price of sin is a burning hell. Look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. You might say, why do I have to burn in hell after I die? Because of sin? Come on, pastor. I mean, give me a break. No one is perfect. Why would God damn somebody to hell for all eternity... I mean, Adolf Hitler, he might be evil, but he's not going to let someone burn forever without dying. Well, yeah, you're right. You know why? Because all of those are men. I wouldn't do that to you because I'm a man. I think if any man did that, that they'd be a wicked person. But God, he's righteous and holy for doing it. You might say, that doesn't make sense. That's totally unfair. Well, the thing is this. God, he is not human like you. He is not man. He is God. He transformed himself. He manifested, manifested himself into a man before when he became Jesus. But God is God. And because God is God, he is forever, you must understand. Being a person, a God who lives forever, you must understand that as a God who lives forever, he cannot have your sin with him forever. As a being who lives forever, he has to make sure that sin is punished within his timetable. Now, you've got to understand this, is that to God, sin is a huge crime against him compared to all other crimes. The idea is, is that God is 100% perfect. And as a 100% perfect God, he is also 100% justice. What is justice? It must punish wrongdoing. So what does God do with your sin? He punishes your sin forever. You might say, why? Because God is eternal. And because God is uh, eternal, he must eternally judge your sin. Why? Because sin, people don't realize this, it's forever. Right. It's stuck forever. It's not something that uh, you can pay for it and it's gone. Sin is the one that's being unfair, not God. Sin is the one that's unjust, not God. Sin is the one that's so cruel, not God. But see, you take sin lightly, don't you? That's why you keep drinking, partying, and gambling, and then sure. cursing out God's name. And don't think that, well, if I skip church, skip reading the Bible and stuff like that, it's not a big deal. See, to human nature, mankind, it's not a big deal. But to God it is. Why? Because he is 100% Holy. Amen. And God cannot compromise Amen. one sin into heaven. He cannot compromise punishing. If he lets it go a little bit and make it 99% rather than 100%, God cannot be God. God cannot be God. God has to be 100% God with his 100% attributes. So his attributes of justice and wrath and also holiness has to remain. It cannot be compromised. Belittle the hellfire damnation and the judgment against sin, you're belittling how he takes holiness seriously 100%. How he takes wrath and judgment against sin, you're belittling the 100%. See, that's why the Bible says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, but the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and no liars shall have their part. And the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So notice here that these list of sinners burn in hell. And it says lake of fire. This is where you're at. 
You're at the lake of fire. Right. I mean, think about it, friend. Do you want to burn forever without dying? Imagine that. Did you ever burn your hand before? Uh, it's unbearable, right? But imagine that went on forever and ever. You know, they said that burning at the stake during the dark ages, that was the cruelest way to die because it can go on for hours. So they knew how to torture people that time. And God knows the most perfect judgment, the most perfect 100% wrath that would ever be proven is burning in hell forever. This is why we want to make sure you're saved. Why would you be offended about that? Would you be offended at somebody who, if he is your next door neighbor and he saw your house on fire, that he disrupted your comfortable sleep, your com comfortable state by yelling out loud, your house is on fire, get out or you're going to die. Why would you be offended about that? No, you would thank that neighbor and say, thank you for disrupting my comfort zone so that I can wake up out of sleep and get out of the house and save my own life. Amen. Well, my friend, right now you're in your comfort zone and no one ever told you about hellfire. And you want to stay asleep. You want to stay in your comfort zone. Why don't you be thankful to people like me who care about your soul and tell you, look, your soul is going to be on fire. Get out of there. That's right. right. Amen. So then, how do you get out of there? Well, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Turn over there. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. The answer is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And it is through Calvary that the Lord Jesus Christ, he was able to reconcile God with man. Wow. What a Lord. thing. What a thing. Because remember, God is 100% holy. You're not. Well, he can't compromise his 100% holiness, right? If he cannot compromise that, then that means that he has to have 100% zero sin. He has to have that. 100% zero sin. How are you going to get that? That's impossible. How are you going to get 100% zero sin? You can't do it yourself. You need Jesus Christ. Amen. So Jesus Christ, Amen. what did he do? He traded your sins with his righteousness. Amen. He took your sin upon himself and offered a way out for all of mankind. Amen. The Bible says in Romans 5 verse 8, But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. You see, you got to realize this is that in order to be saved from God's wrath in hell, Jesus Christ had to die for you. And when he died for you, at that moment, at that moment on Calvary when he died for you, he was able to wash away every sin you've committed in your life. Thus, you have zero sin and you can go to heaven. That's why he died on the cross. Praise you ever wonder Lord. why he died on the cross? I mean, you know all the typical answers people would say. It's because of salvation. It's because of forgiveness. It's because it's a great noble deed. Do you even understand what that means? Some of you are just saying that because you've been coached. That's why sometimes you have to really ask yourself, am I really saved? Am I really saved? Do you understand what all those mean? You don't, do you? Let's make it simple. Why do you go to hell? Sin. It's that simple. You know what's the only thing that can wash away your sin? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And it's because of that blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that sin is out. He washes every single sin you've done in your mind, in your heart, and every action that you've done in your life. Amen. So because of that blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, it washes every sin you've done, thus making you clean to go to heaven. Yes. Now, do you understand why Jesus died for you? He loved you that much. Amen. See, God, Jesus, Jesus is God, but he left heaven to come down here on earth and to die for you on the cross. See, this arrow is you. You fall short of God's glory up in heaven. And what Jesus Christ had to do was to shorten himself, so to speak, and come down low, humble himself, and die on the cross, and take your sin upon himself, so that you can go up. Praise God. So that act is very important. Now, do you understand why Jesus died on the cross for you? Now, do you understand what that's all about? You know, a lot of people, 
they think that they're saved. Why? Because they're a good Christian or they love Jesus. They've been faithful in church, etc., etc. But my friend, go to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll look at verse 8 through 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. You know why you doubt that you're saved? Because of some sin you're still messing around with right now. The reason why that you're not sure that you're going to go to heaven is because how wicked your life is. My friend, you got to realize this. Why are you looking at the things you do? Why are you looking at the things you do that count for your salvation? To go to heaven, to get saved, is not by what you do. Look at this person here. He thinks that by what he does, that he's saved. But this little rap that he's in is about to be swallowed up by what? The depths of his sin. This ocean of sin and hell fire. What do I mean by that? It's that simple. No matter how good you live your life, it's not going to eliminate your sin. See, people think like it's karma that all my good will outweigh my bad and etc. But you forget again, God is 100% holy. That means he wants you to have zero sin. Now, come on, be honest. No one, no one, no one in history is like that. You know how you get 100% no sin? It's easy. How? How? I can't do it, Pastor. Exactly. You can't do it. The blood of Jesus made it 100% no sin. Did you forget? Wash all your sin away. That's right. What are you looking at? Are you looking at what Jesus did for you? Or are you looking at what you're doing for yourself? That's why you're scared that you're going to burn in hell. Because you feel like you haven't attended church as much. You haven't cleaned up your sin. Some of you are still messing around with sin and you feel like you're unworthy. That you, you're not saved. Some of you are really wicked people and you think you're not saved. But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 through 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. And then not of yourselves. Isn't that what it says? Not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Salvation is a gift. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. See that? This man is boasting. Look what I did, Lord. Let me ask that question again. If God were to hold your foot and open up hell itself where Leviathan is right down there and he says, give me one good reason why I shouldn't drop you to hell, what's the first thing you're going to say? Because I've been a Christian? I attended Gene Kim's church all the time. Lord, you saw me watch his teachings, subscribe to his channel. Lord, uh, you've seen me Love you all my life. I pray to you. And what are you looking at? What you're doing? You're not looking at Jesus Christ. You know what you should say? You should say, Lord, nothing on myself because I deserve hell on anything I do. Lord, you need to look at Jesus Christ, what he did for me. That's why I can get out of hell. That's the idea. So salvation is not something that you can boast about. Notice it says not of yourselves. It's nothing, absolutely nothing that you do. Right. How many Christian churches are teaching the heresy that uh, when you get saved, that you have to repent of your fornication, you have to repent of cussing, you have to repent of swearing, you have to uh, read your Bible, you have to pray, and they think that's salvation. My friend, repenting of all the specific sins that you did in your life See, that's what you're doing again. I have to quit this sin. I have to clean up that sin. I have to do this for the Lord. I have to do that for the Lord. Not of yourselves. Not of yourselves. It's Jesus Christ. Not of yourselves. People don't understand that. Do we belittle repentance? Absolutely not. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Verse 10. You know, are you really saved? You have to ask yourself that question. Are you really saved? Some people say, yeah, I'm saved. And I would ask them, how do you know you're saved? And some people might give them the answer that, oh, I just repeated a sinner's prayer. Some people say, oh, I always believed Jesus, that he died, buried, resurrected. But see, here's the thing, my friend, is that you cannot put your trust on the cross of Calvary to get rid of your sins if you're not willing for your sins to be rid of to begin with. Look at this picture here. He's drowning in his sin. These are all your sins. And if you stay in right here, then you're going to die and burn in hell. You can't say while you're in here, oh, I believe on Jesus Christ and do that. No, you have to.
be delivered from this. See, this person is not going to receive help. And here's this life, uh, here's this uh, lifesaver where he gets the gospel from the shed blood of the cross of Calvary. He cannot get that if he goes like this. Let me stay right here. He has to have that change of mind. Lord, deliver me from this mess. And that's what we talk about repentance. See, that's the confusion. People think it's something that you have to do. You have to stop your smoking. You have to stop your fornication. You have to stop your sinning. And you have to read your Bible. You have to pray. My friend, it's not something that you do. It's Jesus Christ. He's the one that's Amen. offering you that's right. the way out. Yes. Repentance is simply, though, that change of mind concerning this sinful condition that you're in. Amen. If you have that change of mind, Lord, I want to get out, you can't do anything yourself to get out. Right. What you need to do is, Lord, I have this change of mind about sin, but it's nothing that I can do, so you need to help me. And Jesus says, here you go, boom, like that. He's the one that gives you the way out. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So notice over here that repentance is not something that is uh, repented of. See, some people think that after you repent, then what happens? Let's be honest, you're going to sin again. So then you have to repent again to be saved, and then you have to repent and repent, and then you never know if you're really saved or not. That's why some of you are doubting your salvation. Because some of you think that you have not truly repented of everything in your sinful life. And you keep messing up and messing up. My friend, uh, when you repent for salvation, that person is not to be repented of. It's one time. Let's make this simple. Let's make this simple. Do you want someone to get rid of your sins and save you from hell? Do you have, let's make that simple. Do you? Yes. There you go, your change of mind. Jesus Christ says, here you go. Let him deliver your way out. Amen. Isn't it that simple? Yep. Isn't it that simple, simple for repentance to salvation? So then you might say, okay, then Jesus hands me uh, this lifesaver, pastor. He has to do the work. What do I do? Why? Isn't it simple? I mean, uh, we see the steps. Let's look at the common sense steps here. We see over here that one, that there is this change of mind. He doesn't want to be in here anymore, right? So there is that repentance. And then the second thing is simply believe. Because isn't it obvious that if you don't believe when Jesus hands you this lifesaver, if you don't believe that's going to rescue you, then you're not going to be rescued. You're going to be burned. Let's say this person, when he is handed this lifesaver, and then he thinks, well, I don't think that this is good enough to save me. There's something I have to do. I have to paddle a little harder. Or maybe I have to kick up my feet a little harder. Maybe I have to help out God by pulling myself in once I get this lifesaver. See, he's not really believing on Jesus Christ. He's trusting in himself again. Do you really believe on Jesus Christ for your salvation? You know what the wrong kind of belief you have? A lot of people believe Jesus died, buried, and resurrected. But see, they have a head belief not a heart belief. It's one thing, let's use a different example besides a lifesaver. Let's talk about a bridge. There's this bridge, and it's scary. But you know this bridge is going to hold you up. You believe that. You know that in your head. You know that in your head, and you believe it in your head that the bridge is going to hold you up. But you don't really believe it with all your heart until you actually step on that bridge and walk on it. Right? Let me give another example. The chair that you're sitting on. You believe that it's going to hold you up when you sit down on it. But that's all in the head. You won't really believe it in your heart until you actually sit on it. Right? See, there's a total different belief from the head versus the heart. Do you truly believe that when Jesus died, buried, and resurrected, that that's enough to save you? Do you truly believe that with all your heart? Or you just know it in your head? Mm, that's good. Because I'll tell you what, if you believe it in your head, I know how it's going to be belief in the head. Bring that example again. God opens up hell and says, all right, give me one good reason why I should, why I should not drop you into hell. What's the first thing you're going to say? Lord, I've been a good Christian. 
I've uh, loved Jesus. I've always believed all my life, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my friend, that's a dangerous thing. Some people see they're relying on themselves. Especially that last line, I believed all my life. That's dangerous. That's a head belief again. You might say, really? Yes, because the Bible says, go to Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. It has to be a specific time and place. If someone were to ask you, how did you get saved? How are you going to answer them? How did you get saved? Well, I always grew up a Christian most of my life. You should be checking your salvation then. What did you mean by that? I mean, come on. Uh, when you believed, when did the belief start, right? Isn't believing on Jesus Christ enough for your salvation? If believing is enough, for your salvation, here's my question. Okay, then when did you believe? You don't even remember? Then I question your belief. Well, I believe all my life. What do you mean believe all my life? Then are you constantly relying on, I have to keep believing to go to heaven? You don't believe that that one time that you believed on Jesus Christ is enough to save you? How about that? When you believed and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, did you really believe that was enough to save you? If you did, why is it a progress of your belief then? Oh, I believed on my life. See, then you're relying on your head belief for your salvation. It's not truly from the heart. Did you truly believe with all of your heart on what Jesus did for you to save you? Then belief one time should have been good enough. Why are you relying on a process of belief? Oh, I believed all my life. I've been a Christian all my life, and I've always believed. See, you're relying on a process. You're not truly believing on what he did for you on the cross to save you. Because if you truly believe, that, sh that one time should have been enough then. Yeah. Why are you relying on, I have to keep believing, and it's a progress? No, my friend, then you're not really trusting in the cross of Calvary. You're relying more on your head for your salvation. I can tell you how I got saved. You might say, really? You can tell me. Yeah, simple. There was, a, there was a moment of time that I did believe. I did that moment of belief. I can't just say I've always been a believer all my life. If I do that, then I'm relying on some kind of process or head belief. I mean, can you tell me how you got saved? Can you give me your testimony? What is it? Oh, I felt something burning in my heart and then... I just had a sense of believing in Jesus. No, that's wrong. That you're relying on feelings then. Can you tell me a testimony how you got saved? I saw Jesus in a vision or he spoke to me. At that time, I just believed on Jesus. And no, that's then you're relying on a vision, on what you see. Are you truly relying on what he did for you on the cross of Calvary? Do you really believe that when he died, and he buried and resurrected. That very act, when he shed his blood for you, do you believe that when he did that action, that he saved your soul? You say, yes, I do, preacher. Then you're saved that way. It's that simple. It's that simple. If it's, it's what the Bible says. The Bible says what? The Bible says that in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. So do you believe what God said to you at that verse, that if you, that what Jesus did for you on the cross, that his precious blood washed away your sin, that that saved you? Yes, I believe that's simple. It's that simple. Why are you, uh, see, this is relying on what he did, believing what he did, not on what you see in a dream or a vision. Amen. And that's why you believed. Not because you always knew and that's why you believed. Not in your feelings, how you felt in your heart. And that's why you believe. No, then you're relying on the wrong thing. It's simple. All you have to rely on is just believing what he did. It's Amen. that simple. That's right. It's that simple. See, the devil has confused the gospel so much where they talk about Jesus died, buried, and resurrected, and they don't really understand what that means. You might say, well then, pastor, I do believe. If you believe, then this will mark it down for you. 
Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. It's confess. And when people hear confess, they think, oh, yeah, I do that all the time. I pray to the Lord and confess my sins to him. No, that's not what I meant. Well, I go to a priest and I can go to confession. No, that's not what I meant. Confess simply means to say it publicly. To say it publicly. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is that this yeah. makes everything simple. These all go hand in hand together. How I can tell you a moment in time when I believed on Christ for salvation is because when I confessed to him. When I was, nine year, uh, when I was six years old, someone took me aside, a deacon took me aside, showed me the gospel. And it wasn't something that I saw or heard a voice or I had some kind of feeling. Or, no, it was just simple. When I, when I heard what Jesus did, he died, buried, and resurrected. Do you believe on that? And what did I do? I said it out of my mouth. I said, yeah, I believe in that. I trust in that. When I said that, that marked down my salvation. Amen. Amen. Now, is that your testimony? Or is it all again inside your head, right? Ah. Is it all again inside your head because, oh, I've always believed and I believed in my mind. No, 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 no. You know, if you said that out of your mouth, the moment that you believed, then that should have been enough. That should have been enough. You might say, well, I'm mute. What about people who are mute, who can't talk, etc., etc.? It's okay. You don't have to like literally audibly say the words, but there has to be something where you, uh, whether you said it in your heart or said it out of your mouth or etc., the thing is, is that you said, Lord, I'm telling you, I believe and I trust what you did on the cross to save me. Think about this. Amen. God would have not sent out that life saver to save you from your sin until you what? Show him, you tell him that, God, I need that. I need that. So then when you call out to God, then God will say, okay, here you go. And then he hands you this life saver. And then when you hand this life saver, it's at that moment at time that you believed. Amen. It's that moment at time that the Lord saved your soul. See, the idea is this, is that God's not going to send you salvation until you actually tell him. You just tell him this. You tell him, God, I believe what you did on the cross of Calvary, that your shed blood is what saved my soul. So give it to me. Amen. Save me. And then God will go, okay, here it is. Boom. And then... You're saved. <laughs> it's that simple. That's how you mark it down. You mark it down how we can tell 100% where it's marked down. Specific time, specific place, incident is when did you say that to the Lord? See, some people think that, well, I do it every night. I, I always pray every night, Lord, save me, Lord, save me, Lord, save me. No, 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 no. See, uh, you're, conf you're confusing it again. See, look at this three together. This is what we're calling the gospel, the entirety of the gospel. Amen. Did you hear anything like this before? You might go, no, I never heard it before. Then, you know, you're probably lost. You're probably not saved. Maybe you are. I can't judge you. It's between you and God. But I want to make sure you're saved and you have 100% assurance. The gospel is this, what? Because of your sin... Not because you've been a Christian all your life and stuff like that. Because of your sin, you're burning in hell. Did you knew that before? Did you know that Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected? And that, to do that to save you from your sin, to save you from hell? Did you know that before? Or you didn't know that until now? If you knew that, then see, what happens is that's where repentance comes in. Repentance is, see, there's that change of mind concerning Amen. your sinful condition. Amen. You want to get out. So then you want to get out. Then what you have to do? You have to believe. Amen. You have to believe that when this lifesaver is enough to get you out. If you believe in that, then here's the last thing. See, then you need to say, okay, God, I believe Amen. that that's enough to save me. Will you save me then? And then boom, you're saved. Amen. Amen. Did you have something like that? If not, then... You should check your salvation. Do you understand now why that there has to be a specific time and place and situation that you got saved? 
And it's not some kind of imaginary fantasy that you made up in your mind where you're like, well, I always believed. Yeah. I'm always a Christian. If you can't point out a specific time, place, and situation, then you've always had a misconception and a fantasy in your mind of being saved. Is there a specific time, place? Maybe now could be that time and place. Time and place is this. I heard Pastor Kim giving the gospel. And then I was convicted over my sinful condition. So I had a change of mind. And then I believed. And what I believed is, look, it's not just uh, people talk about being a believer and believing, believing. You can't just believe in thin air or just believe in God. Believe what about God then? What, that he created the universe? Believe what about God? You got to believe in something specific. That when he died, buried and resurrected, that blood was enough to get rid of all my sins. That's specifically what I believed in. Amen. I believe that this very act was enough to save me from my sin. And that's why I said it to him. I called upon him and said, Lord, I'm going to trust and believe only what you did on the cross to save me from hell. Save me. Amen. And do you see that? There's nothing of yourself, your good works you're relying on. There's nothing of some kind of sin that you have to change and clean up your life. It's nothing what you do. It's specifically all Him. It's all of Him that saves you. Would you like to do that right now and receive Christ for your salvation? Do you really have Jesus Christ for your salvation or you don't? People say, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I made Jesus Christ my personal Savior. I received Christ into my life. I invited Christ into my heart. And they have no idea what, what those terms mean. But now you know what that means. What it means is, see all this three? I know I'm a sinner and that I go to hell and that sin will take me to hell. I have a change of mind about that. But there's nothing that I can do to get me out of this condition. I have to trust and believe, rely on this to save me. Amen. What is this? What is this? His shed blood makes it zero sin. He died, buried, and resurrected to get rid of all my sin. I specifically believe in that as my solution. Amen. Amen. And then, if I do, I just said it to him. I told it to him. God, I do. God, I do believe in that very act, that what you did on the cross to save me. And then, God says at Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Look at verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall, shall be, saved. be saved. That's how you got saved. People say, well, I've done the sinner's prayer before, but see, you're relying on a prayer to save you. And do you even understand what a sinner's prayer is? Do you even understand what that means? You don't, do you? You just heard the term and you repeated words after some preacher. See, that's not what it is. What the sinner's prayer is, see, is that this sinner realized this sin would put him to hell and had a change of mind. So he had to trust on what Jesus did to save him. That's why he said it. He prayed it to him. See that? It's not just, God, forgive me for my sin. No. You're not, uh, did you, are you trusting in this very act what he did for you to save you? Or you just ask God to forgive you? There's a clearly a big difference between those two. There's clearly a difference with repeating words in a prayer compared to from your heart, you have this repentance over your sinful condition and you're trusting in what he did on the cross to save you. There's a clear difference with just repeating words in a prayer and doing these two things when you say it to him in prayer. Amen. There's a clearly a big difference. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to get saved right now? And then next time when people ask you, how did you get saved? You can say, I've heard Pastor Kim give this presentation of the gospel. And then what I did is, as a repentant sinner, I told God that I'm trusting on what he did on the cross to save me. I give you this opportunity now to do so. And let's do this sinner's prayer rightly this time. And remember, repeating words in a prayer don't save you. It's what he did on the cross that saves you. So let's say it to him. 
If you would all bow your heads and close your eyes, and then onliners, you can repeat after me as I say these words. Dear God, I repent as a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected to save me from hell. So I'm only relying on that precious blood, on that very act that you did on the cross to save me. I'm not relying on my head belief or anything I do or cleaning up my sins or any good thing I do to save me. I only believe what you did to save me. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Did you mean that with all your heart this time? And it's not just some things that you've always had swimming in your head <laughs> about a belief or, you know, I've always believed stuff like that. No, this time, did you mean it with your heart and you put that action upon what Jesus did for you on the cross? If you did, my friend, then you're saved. Now that you're saved, you got to remember this, my friend, is look at this flag of so many religions. It's a sad, sad world and Satan has confused people on how to get saved because of so many religions. Why? Because Satan wants to eat their soul and want them to burn in hell with him. There's Buddhism, Catholicism, Islam, and etc. How many people do you know are going to burn in hell? You got saved from hell. Don't you want your loved one to get saved and go to heaven? But there are too many lies in this world and the only way you can find the truth is that through this word of God, the Bible, and you might say, man, so I need to get myself a Bible. Yeah, you do. Because I could be teaching you what's wrong too. How do you know what I teach is true or not? It's only from this Bible. And you can't do that through 200 different modern versions of the Bible when they all say different words and contradict each other. Get yourself a King James Bible. Get yourself a King James Bible. You need to become a Bible believer. How do you become a Bible believer? Uh... What is a Bible believer? I hope that you'll enjoy the, I hope that you'll enjoy our group. Uh, please go to our YouTube playlist and there's dispensationalism. And there's also defending the KJV. If you would watch those two playlists, you got to understand that dispensationalism and the King James Bible distinguishes us from a horde of wrong doctrines out there. Well, I need to get myself into a Bible-believing church then. I'm all by myself. You're exactly right. You need to go to a Bible-believing church. Don't be by yourself. That's the worst case you can be in. No wonder you had a, probably a head belief before, right? Because you watched so many things or heard so many teachings, and then you just created a mesh of your own belief. And that's not the right belief. Maybe that's why. So you need to be filtered out and be guided into right doctrine in truth. So you need to get yourself a King James Bible to test, your, to test everything and to find the truth. And you need someone or a group of people to help you get started in that, to help guide you in that one. And then you have to test that people with scripture to see if it's true or false. So don't just go to a church because there are so many different churches with different beliefs. You need to go to a King James only, dispensational, Bible-believing, independent, fundamental Baptist church. How do I find that? Please go to our website, www.realbiblebelievers.com. And then once you go in there, you'll find our church directory. We're in process of starting a connect group as well. So please attend a Bible-believing church. You might say, well, I'm a person in a Muslim territory and probably uh, in the country of Saudi Arabia, and there's not a Bible-believing church miles and miles away, and uh, I'm at the other part of the world. Well, we're starting a connect group. Uh, go to our website and connect with the group, and then we'll help you get started. And hopefully, Lord willing, we can plant a Bible-believing church over there one day, and there will be a Bible-believing preacher or missionary who might have a burden for your territory, and we can open up fertile ground for them to come over there.
one day. So until then, please try your best to attain a Bible-believing church. Immerse yourself with the Bible-believing group. And remember this. You're saved. You're going to heaven. But so many people are deceived by lies out there. There's so many lies out there. We got to give them the truth. We got to open their Amen. eyes from darkness into light. Amen. And in order to do that, get involved with a Bible-believing work, a Bible-believing church. Don't just click on so many endless videos on YouTube anymore and connect yourself with different groups who have so many different beliefs and they all don't agree. Get yourself into a Bible-believing church. Remember this, no pastor and no people in a church is perfect. You might find some flaws. But the idea is this, is that you want to get yourself with the best group of people in your area. And the Lord gave the church for a reason. If someone were to ask you next time, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? You said yes. And they asked you how? This time, don't give the same answer. Oh, I've always believed or, or I'm a Christian or, you know, I've done good things for the Lord. I love Jesus Christ, or I saw Jesus in a vision, I felt something, or I repeated some kind of prayer. No, it's not that. Tell us specifically how you get saved. Now tell us your testimony. What can you say this time? You can tell us a specific situation, time, and place this time, right? Well, I bumped across this video, and there was this preacher who told me about how to get saved. And what I did was, is that I realized that I was a sinner on my way to hell. So I had to repent. When I repented, I had to believe what Jesus did on the cross to save me. I only trust in that act alone. And I said it to him. This time, let your testimony be proven true. Don't let it be a shaky testimony anymore. Why doubt your salvation? Why doubt your salvation when God said you, when God told you how to get saved from Scripture? Is God a liar? Is God a liar? He is not a liar. So you know what? You put your faith on the Word of God, on what He told you on how to get saved. Not on your experience, not on your feeling, not on you think, oh, I think I'm saved. And you're putting your faith on the wrong thing, aren't you? What did He tell you from the Scripture? He told you to do this. If you did that, that's enough. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that you'll bless this video in a mighty way, get people involved in a Bible-believing work, and to get saved. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.